now and then my immaturity still comes out when I get a motor and wheels, but I use it as discipleship, so uh, I guess that's a pretty good excuse to be able to do that, so. <laughs> Jeff and Kristen, do you have Alex back there? Is he stuck behind there? Uh, we get the privilege of sending you guys out today, and uh, how many years ago was it that I did your wedding? Six years ago, and uh, Joe and Vicky's daughter and son-in-law and grandson are heading to Hawaii next week, a couple weeks, Wednesday, okay, and uh, today is their last Sunday here with us, and would you guys just stand right where you are, and uh, we got a couple of, a couple of uh, chaplain and a former chaplain right there, they're going to reach back and lay hands on you, would you just stretch your hands for, towards them, and we want to bless them and send them on this new journey, Father, thank you. For Jeff and Kristen and Alex, Lord, I pray that you would just pave the way for them. Everything from their, their long-term housing to their church family to the friendships to the, the group of people that will be called their family for these next number of months. And Lord, I thank you that you have sent people, you are sending people, and you will send them to a people as they go. Protect them spirit, soul, and body and prosper them as they go in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Everybody say grace. Grace, grace unlimited and grace unleashed. I got to thinking about this, and I, they tell me that I'm a forward thinker sometimes, and I see things, and so I dream a little bit, and I have to reel myself back in, but I had this thought recently. What would the world look like if God's unlimited grace was unleashed through each and every one of us every moment of every day in the world around us? Ah, yeah, that's kind of idealistic and so forth. But what would the world look like if God's unlimited grace was released through you and through me all the time. Just imagine that. Imagine that in your family. Imagine that at your workplace. Imagine that in our community. And imagine that in the world. Now, I was reading this week in, in Luke in, on the reading plan, and I had as I normally do, the newspaper in one hand and the Bible in the other hand, and I got a little confused as to which one I was reading. Because I was reading the passage of Scripture that was talking about the end times, and I was reading the newspaper, and I said, wait a second, these are the headlines from 2,000 years ago. It's, it's today. Our world needs a release of God's unlimited grace, and it starts in your sphere of influence. Let's look at a couple of things here because when I say grace, you're thinking, some of you are thinking, yes, we say grace at Thanksgiving before we partake in the turkey. That's not what I'm talking about. Grace is, there's a difference between mercy and grace. You know the difference between mercy and grace? Mercy is when you don't get something that you deserve. Grace is when you get something that you don't deserve. So, for example, someone plows into your car and totals your car. Mercy is saying, don't worry about it. You don't have to call your insurance company and make your rates go up. <laughs> Some of you just said, I have no idea what you just said there, but it is not something that I would do, okay? So we, we like mercy when it comes our way. We don't like mercy when we have to give, dole it out, right? But grace would be saying, not only is my car totaled and you don't have to pay, but I'm going to take money out of my own pocket to fix your car so that you have something to drive as well. Oh, you think that's absolutely crazy. You're an idiot, Pastor. What are you talking about? It's an illustration, all right? 
I'm not saying that that's what I would do. Please do not hit me, all right? But think about this. Isn't that what Jesus did? Look at, look at what uh, Romans chapter uh, 3 and verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Any former sinners, recovering sinners, redeemed sinners in the house? Thank you. Everybody should have your hand up. Because you just lied if you didn't, and that makes you a sinner. Thank God for grace. Because Romans, Romans 6.23, if you've memorized the Roman road to lead somebody to Jesus, says, for the wages of sin is what? Death. Any sinners? What do you deserve? Okay, that's the bad news. But the good news is the gift of God is eternal life. Everybody say life. In Christ Jesus our Lord. So we deserve, we're sinners. We deserve death. We total God's car. And he says, mercy, don't worry about it. Not only have you totaled my car, but I'm going to give you a new car. Hallelujah. By the way, did we win the ducky race yesterday? Oh, man, it's really counting on that. Okay. But be, here's, here's the thing. If you know Christ, then you have his grace in your life. That should make every day a happy day for you because you have his grace. You wake up in the morning and you think of all the things that you have to do that day and all the things that aren't going right and it can get overwhelming. Ever happen? Some of you didn't sleep all night because you were thinking of those things all night that kept you up. But in the morning when you wake up, you say, I was a sinner on my way to hell and Jesus saved me and gave me eternal life. That's a good day. So would you say these words with me? I have God's grace. Let's say that. I have God's grace. Let's say it a second time. I have God's grace. One more time. I have God's grace. Now, just in case there's someone here that says, I have not received the grace of God, and I am on my way to you know where, if I were to die right now, here's what I want us to do. I want us to reaffirm corporately our commitment to the grace of God in our life. And it's going to look something like this. If you would just repeat after me what we would call a sinner's prayer. I think this is great because no matter how many times you have said this prayer, there is something about recognizing the need for God's grace because without it, I'm on my way to death. So let's reaffirm. It's like renewing your vows. So I'll say it and then you can repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I recognize that I'm a sinner and I need you. I need you to forgive my sin. I turn from my old way of life and I choose to follow you. Thank you for paying for my sin so that I don't have to. And I receive your free gift of life. Thank you. Amen. Just take a deep breath. There should be a peace that comes from his grace in our life. So, how many of you have the grace of God in your life? I want to see your hand. Good. That's step one. Now, step two is we experience not only the grace of God, but we have God's grace for a purpose. And that purpose is to share. I was doing a little bit of research this week about revivals in Virginia, in our state. Being the, the hub D area pastor for Virginia, I said, God, where are the times that there were 
just outpourings of your Holy Spirit in our state. And you know what I, what I found? Was that during the Civil War, there was an outpouring of God among the soldiers on both sides, Union and Confederate, and about 100,000 Confederate soldiers gave their lives to the Lord in this revival, and between 100 and 200,000 Union soldiers gave their lives to the Lord as a result of experiencing the grace of God through the war. Those of you that are chaplains or have been chaplains, there was an exciting precedent to your job because there were men that came into the war-torn areas bringing the gospel, and they set up camps outside of the camps. And at night and on the Sabbath, they would go from the war and they would put a hold on the war, and both sides would go to their respective places of worship, and they experienced outpourings of the Spirit of God. And here's one account. A guy named J.W. Jones was traveling through the South after the war, and he looked over, and he saw a one-armed man plowing in the field. And he recognized the guy. And he went over to him, and he had seen him from, from the war, and this was a guy that had a promising life ahead of him, a college-bound uh, fella, and he had gone off to the war and, and lost his arm and uh, kind of dashed his hopes at that time of being what he thought he was going to be. Jones, J.W. Jones, had the privilege of leading into the Lord and baptizing him while he was a soldier, before he lost his arm. And he went up to him, and he, was, he saw this man, and, and he, his life had been wrecked, and he was uh, just wanting to console him and wanting to encourage him, and, and he said uh, some, some kind words, and this was the response of the man. Oh, Brother Jones, that's all right. I thank God that I have one arm left and an opportunity to use it for the support of those I love as he plowed the field with one arm behind his, his uh, horse, his mule. And it was stories like that with people who had experienced the grace of God and were continuing to experience the grace of God that propelled Jones to be able to take that message to other people and share that. Have you experienced the power and the grace of God in your life? Yes. Yes. We have the grace of God, and now we share the grace of God. Acts chapter 3, uh, one of my favorite go-to scriptures, uh, 3 and 4 is just amazing. You have Peter and John, and they're going to the to the temple, they're going to pray. They see a, a lame man along the way. And remember the, the kid's song, you know, Peter and John went to pray, they met a lame man on the way. Remember that one, right? Well, he looks at them thinking that he's going to get something from them. And they pull out their pockets and they're like, hey, silver and gold, we don't have. But what we have, we give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, he pulled him up, and immediately his legs and his ankles became whole. And he went walking and leaping and praising God. They shared the grace in the power of God wherever they went. They, they weren't on a mission trip. They were just going to pray like they did. Every day at 3 in the afternoon, they walk up to the time of prayer, and they probably saw this guy there every day. And this one day, they said, what do you think? Let's do it. And they raised him up. Now, they got in a little bit of trouble for it. And the uh, religious authorities in chapter 4, Acts 4, verses 5 through 7, and then down to 13, they questioned Peter and John, by what power or by what name did you do this? By the way, religious people don't like it when you share the grace of God to other people around them. It really makes them look bad. It's like you just healed somebody and, and they're doing some sort of a, a religious um, 
gesture that they want to call their relationship with God. It's, it's not. And you have the power of God in you, and you come up and you begin to minister to people wholeness and life, and they get a little bent out of shape. It says that in verse 13, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. When you've been with Jesus, the grace of God overflows out of you and you can't stop the flow. Well, you can. Not recommended, by the way. But it just, there's more grace than you need for yourself. It's designed that way. Yesterday, I was, I was praying for some people. We closed out our hub meeting. We had churches from all over Virginia. And at the end, we had kind of a commissioning service. Got to, had people come forward. We prayed over them, and we sent them forth. And I was encouraging some of our leaders to just be prophetic and, and pray and let the word of the Lord come through them. And as I was standing there, I saw somebody kind of in the back that the Lord was putting their uh, putting his finger on like I needed to go. So I pressed through the crowd, moved people away, and, and I began to just pray, um, you know, over this guy. And, and when I was done, I was like, done, okay, I need to get back up on the platform. And as I turned, I saw a, a young woman that the Lord just spoke something to me. And then I had a decision to make. Do I get back on, up on the platform where I need to be to run the rest of the meeting, or do I deliver the word of the Lord because it's just overflowing? The grace of God is just overflowing. You ever put, God ever put you in those awkward situations? And I figured, well, hey, if this is what he's saying, this is what I'm hearing, it's far better to do it than to stay on schedule. Kind of like we did this morning, right? We can get up here and have a song service. Did our little thing, you know, if Jesus shows up, great. If not, we go home. Or we can come into the presence of the Lord, and whatever he says, we do. Whatever we see him doing, we do. And so I stopped, and I began to just deliver the word of the Lord. I saw this picture, and I began to just say it to her, and she immediately just begins to just weep. She begins to cry. I was like, wow, they're, they're, God must have spoken something to her. overflow should be a regular part of the way we live life. You have the grace, right? We agreed on that. You all raised your hands. Now you're not raising your hands again, okay? So I'm like, you're backing out on me. This is only step two. We're going to get to step four. But, but you, you have the grace. If Jesus is in you, you have the grace. But it's not just for you. It's so that you can then share the grace. So let's say this together. I have God's grace. Now we're going to go to level two. I have God's grace to share. The third thing is, I have a platform on which to share his grace. That's a little longer. Somebody's you're going to have to write it down, okay? I have a platform on which to share his grace. Now, what do I mean by a platform? Not everybody is called to be on a literal platform and stand and proclaim the word of the Lord. That's part of my calling. But when we look at what our platform is, we each have a platform that is a place where the grace of God flows from our life. Might be different from the next person's life. Don't compare your platforms. Everybody say that. Don't compare your platforms. But now say, I have a platform on which to share his grace. Go ahead. I have a platform on which to share his grace. You really believe that? I can tell by some of your faces you don't believe that you have a platform. Okay, let me describe some platforms. For some, your platform is praying for the waitress. All right, Marla, last night on our way home, her husband is having a procedure that's done on Tuesday. They're going to check out and see what the situation is. 
So he asked Marla if she would join us for prayer to be able to pray for her husband and that situation that she was dealing with. What was the platform? Food! Hallelujah! Anybody in here that's, that doesn't ever eat? Thank you. You have a platform. But you're saying, well, that's just too normal. It has to be like, ooh. No, it doesn't. You have the grace. You have the grace to share. Now figure out the where. That didn't rhyme. That was good. Or Brian at the Cracker Barrel over here who's looking for a career. And we prayed for him and invited him to come and pray with us on that. Or, or the UPS man that came here to drop off something at the church. And, and I turned around and just spoke the word of the Lord over him as he's like, and he, and he walks out. Or, or Tammy in the doctor's office that's getting ready to have a, feels like she has an epileptic seizure come on. And I want to read my newspaper. It's like read my newspaper or pray for somebody that's getting ready to have an epileptic seizure. Well, I, I think, you know, it's pretty clear. What, what was my platform? I'm sitting in a chair in a doctor's office. Serve the city. We got Serve the City coming up in June. If you've not participated in Serve the City, please, Ed, would you wave? Wave. Ed is overseeing our Serve the City uh, outreach this year. And what we do is we go into the community. We've adopted a neighborhood, and churches all over the city have adopted neighborhoods. And we go in and we transform this neighborhood along with other partnering churches. And we do simple repairs and, and things that. We're going to do this project this year where we call it Mending Fences, where we, we repair the fence along the road that drives into the community just to make it look like people actually care in the community, okay? Because they're falling down. Some don't have the money to fix it. And so let's work together and use a platform. It's already prepared for you. You don't have to say, hmm, let me think. I think I'm going to go door to door today. That really freaks me out. How do I do that? No, just say, Ed, can I come and serve? You can hide behind him. He's tall. You can hide behind him and be like, you know, okay, I'm out here. What do I do? You know, and the fearless leader will show you how to use that platform. I have another platform coming up. Fred, did you grab those, uh, those, those little flyers? Yeah. The, uh, I, I need your prayer. Always need your prayer, but Vanessa's uh, part of working with the uh, the FBI, and um, as her role, part of that has put together this uh, thing called Leap of Faith, America's Healing. If you read the newspaper or you watch the news, you know that we are in a place where our country is deeply divided racially religiously in many, many ways. So I get to be a representative for Christ along with an imam, a priest, a rabbi, state's attorney, and our police chief on a panel. Now that's a platform that Quite frankly, I was not real comfortable with. And I said, Lord, how does your grace overflow as your representative? Because let's see this. I have the grace of God, right? You have the grace of God. And we have enough to share. <laughs> Isn't that the cool thing? If I give it away, it's unlimited. Grab that. It's unlimited. So when I share, did you ever have that kind of bread where, you know, you call, we called it Georgie bread. We named our, like, you know, the friendship bread thingy where you, like, take a thing off and then it grows and then you give some to your friend and then, that, then it grows and you have, like, bread muffins or something. It's like yeast that multiplies and you add something to it. And I don't know how it was, but my, it was really cool at my mom's house. But you give it away and there's always more. And 
then the Lord says, okay, now here's a platform that I want you to sit on. It happens to be a literal platform, and, and you're going to have to depend upon me that my grace is going to flow through you. My words are going to flow through you, and I am going to be well represented at the table. So please pray for me, May the 5th. If you want a prayer reminder, you can grab one of these afterwards. And uh, if you want to come, there's only a space for 150 people. You have to RSVP. When it's full, it's full. But um, I, I'd love to have a few people just come and just, you know, be praying during that time that Christ would be represented well, his grace would be represented well through my presence there. So you have, the, the, we, we have platforms. So what is your platform? Think of what your platform is and how the, the grace of God might be represented differently through each one of our lives. You know, maybe a, a, a lawyer has a platform that I will never see. Somebody in the military has a platform that I will never see. A PA will have a platform that I will never see. You could go through every one of your students, people that, that you go to places that I will never see, but your platform is still to preach the grace of God with your life, to let it overflow. Different gifts, Romans 12, verse 6 says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is encouraging, then give encouragement. And if it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. We have divine power to do what he asks us to do in sharing that grace. Just think about this for a moment. What is your platform? You have the grace. You have grace to share. But think specifically. Think of your week. What is your platform? And who's on that? Here's something to think about, too. It's hard to share grace with people that you're mad at. Now, I'm not just talking about husbands and wives here, okay? I'm talking about people groups that you are mad at. I had a certain people group that had, I should say this, I had people from a certain people group that had treated me poorly 25 years ago, and I, I took offense to a particular people group. And our pastors used to take mission trips to that country, and I was like, see if I ever go to that country. No way. Those people, whatever your those people are, you, you know who those people are. I mean, it could be race, it could be religion, it could be those struggling with their gender identity, it could be a certain look, it could be a certain, you, whatever. It could be a skin color, it could be something that reminds you, it could be a smell that reminds you of something, it could be anything, okay? Like, those people are around. So I, I, was, I was dealing with this in my heart, and I just basically said, look, I'm not going to associate with those people because they are all like that. Then another youth pastor who was one of those people started coming to our youth pastor's fellowship that I was running. And I remember sitting in the van one day with him. We'd gone somewhere and we came back. And I said, I said his name. And I said, you have been so much a part of my healing. Because you have not been like my mindset of those people. See, he was a messenger of God's grace to me. And later on, I had the privilege of sharing God's grace with some of his people. Isn't that interesting? So whoever that is that you have trouble sharing God's grace with, get ready, you will be tested because we have this, a mandate, and it's called the Great Commission, to be messengers 
of the grace of God to all people. Can we just say all people? All people. And God tests you in those areas. Luke chapter 9, we just read it this week. It said, Jesus called the 12 together and he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure all diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Matthew 28, 19, 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You have the grace. You have grace to share. You have a platform on which to share it. And you have a mandate. How many of you are still in? <laughs> Three, four, five. Okay, that's good. Preach the same message next week. And we'll get it. I, I really, I really want this power of the Spirit to overflow in my life. I, I want the power of the Spirit to overflow in every one of us here by His grace. Charismata, charis is grace in the Greek. The grace gifts. I mean, we want to talk about the Holy Spirit. And, and, and man, I, I had a fun time here today in the, in the presence of the Lord and in the Holy Spirit. But sometimes we want to get so, as, as charismatics, as Pentecostals, we want to get so, like, into the, the supernatural of the Spirit. And there is a tremendous place for the supernatural in our lives, we want to live there, but we forget that the charis or the grace or the grace gifts are so that grace would overflow to others wherever we go. So we have those high, amazing times, the Peter and John moments where the grace is shared in supernatural healing and power. The word of the Lord comes through you and begins to just read people's mail right where they are. And you're like, wow, that was the coolest thing ever. And then we turn around and someone who needs God's grace bumps into us and they're one of those people. And we're like, oh, yeah, mm-hmm. The grace just drained right out of you. You have grace. Say it again. I have grace. I have grace to share. I have a platform on which to share that grace. And I have a mandate to share the grace. We have a, a video here. And I, I, I don't know how this has... I, I struggle as I read the newspaper and as I read the Bible. I do. I struggle with certain things. And our, our Foursquare Missions Director... Jim Scott shared at cabinet in California when I was out there in March and, and he shared a vision that he had for reaching a particular people group in the Middle East. You know, at first I was like, yeah, well, I, you know, you, you want me to contribute here to this, this global missions fund because as people go to share Christ in the Middle East. It's not like they can just put up a Facebook or a GoFundMe and say, hey, I'm going to be a missionary, you know, in, uh, in Yemen. And we know what happens to our, or happened to our friend Joel, who was killed as a, as a missionary. And so initially I was kind of just like, yeah, okay, whatever. And then God began to move in my heart. Who is going to take the grace of God to those people. It's easy to lump people into a group. Oh, those are the people that just blow people up. Or, oh, those are the people that this. Or those are the people that, yeah, they, they look like that. They act like that. And God says, will your grace flow to them through you? Will my grace flow through you? And so what I felt to do today, I asked the church council on Thursday night. I said, can we do this? We're going to receive a missions offering after this video. It's an unnamed country uh, for security reasons. But the 
Foursquare Church as a whole is going to come together to appropriate God's grace into a place that right now does not have it. And so watch this video and then uh, be prepared to, uh, to give. Yesterday, today, and forever. And this is the message that the Foursquare Church has carried within our own nation and around the world for decades. We believe strongly, we believe powerfully that Jesus can change lives, that he can bring men and women into the kingdom of God, that he brings healing and deliverance, salvation, that families can be restored and bondages can be dropped off. And so with that spirit, that sense of preaching until all have heard, we want to invite you to be part of an opportunity at Connection 2015. We plant churches. The desire of FMI is to plant national church planting movements, not just a church, but a movement of churches that will transform a nation. And we have the opportunity of going to a Middle Eastern country and planting a four-square church where there is no four-square church. I can't tell you the name of this nation, and you would understand that, but this nation is ready for us. We have a team of people that are preparing today, apostolic, catalytic leaders that will plant not just a church, but a movement of churches, churches that will make disciples, develop leaders, that will plant other churches, that will reach into a region. This strategy is a regional strategy, not just an individual nation, but a region to be touched with the gospel. We'd love for you to be a part of this. And so would you, pastor, talk with your church council and congregation about preparing an offering that you will bring to Connection 2015, an offering that's distinct from your normal giving to FMI to support missionaries and mission or to individual missionaries as you support their mission, but a mission a gift that we can give together at Connection to plant this church in this Middle Eastern country, to deploy these individuals that are preparing now, that we can do mission together as we serve. We want to invite you to do this and to begin to pray today about it. Connection 2015 will be a great opportunity to consider how we together can touch the Middle East. And so would you pray? Pastors, would you talk with your church council? We pray you would bring your best offering and we will begin to see this church develop. We will over the years, over this multi-year strategy, see a church develop in the Middle East. We will see a region impacted. And so long as Jesus tarries, the gospel being preached. Thank you for praying, for giving, for partnering and for going as you serve our world with the gospel. God bless you. I'd like you to stand as we prepare to give and, and bring our, our offering. You know, as you do that, God, God's going to speak and show you those areas and those people where, where, you're, where his grace needs to flow through you. Giving is part of it, but he said, pray, give, partner, and go. And going starts where we are, being willing to go to the person that we see every day at the 7-Eleven, every day at the gas station or in the cubicle next to you. It's that, it's that opportunity for the grace of God to flow into your sphere of influence. So Father, as we bring today an offering that will take your grace through these teams of people that are going to give their lives in the Middle East for the cause of the gospel, we thank you today that you also want to use us as we step from our pews, as we come and as we give. Lord, take that as a commitment to be able to say, I'm all in, I'm ready, use me, I have the grace, I have grace to share, I have a platform on which to share it, and I have a mandate from God Almighty to do this. And may we receive your power from on high so that the grace might flow in Jesus' name. Amen. Please bring your gifts this morning.